The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody. My name is Ed Davis. I'm a senior application scientist at Genecopia Incorporated, located in Rockville, Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C. I'd like to thank you all for joining us for today's webinar entitled How to Use Lentivirus in Mammalian Cell Lines. We really appreciate it. Um, before I get into the webinar, I just want to go over a few practical matters. First, you may ask me questions at any time. However, your um, microphones will be muted, so you won't be able to speak vocally to me. Instead, you'll need to send me your questions um, by typing them in the questions box in your control panel. If you can't see your control panel, it might be hidden, in which case look for a small strip of buttons on one side of your screen. One of the buttons will be orange with a white arrow in it, and when you click on that button, you'll then be able to see your control panel and hence the the questions box. Secondly, in um, in the interest of keeping the talk going smoothly, I'm going to wait till the end of the webinar to answer your questions, and and in that case, I'll answer them in the order in which they'll they'll they were received. And finally, um, I'm also going to send you a number of links to um, to download various items or um, or to other types of links. And I'll be doing that through the chat box, which is also located in the control panel. All right, so with that, uh, let's get started with the webinar. All right, so um, I'm going to start off by telling you um, a little bit about who we are at Genecopia and what we're about. We are a company that um, essentially provides many products and services in the fields of functional genomics and cell biology. And um, the largest part of our um, operation is in the um, production of various types of plasmid clones. Uh, and in fact, um, this is what we were founded on as one of the as the original provider and one of the largest providers of um, or for open reading frame clones. So um, in addition to ORF clones, um, we also have a number of clones, um, including gene promoters. And again, these are mostly for um, human and mouse, but also for other organisms like rat. And we've also expanded out to carry various microRNA solutions, the, uh, clone solutions. These are microRNA precursors, inhibitors, and, and uh, three prime UTR targets. We also have a large collection of CRISPR plasmids and construction services. Um, and finally, we have a number of, we have genome-wide collections of um, shRNA clones if you are doing gene knockdown. In addition to that, we of course have viral systems, which we're listening to about today, mainly lentivirus and adeno-associated virus. And then we also have a number of um, stable cell line products such as CRISPR-Cas9 stable cell lines, labeled cancer cell lines, and a new product of um, cancer biomarker mutant cell lines. Further, uh, we're, we're, um, we also have a number of um, solutions, high-quality solutions for kits and reagents, mainly for transfection reagents. We have a bunch of luciferase assay kits for bioluminescence. We carry fish probes um, that are good for um, use in genome editing or for uh, possible um, diagnostics. We have indel detection kits and a number of cloning kits. And finally, we have a large product line dedicated to fluorescent detection, mainly for cell function assays for like apoptosis. We have nucleic acid detection reagents, cell structure probes for detecting things like organelles, and fluorescent dyes. But of course, you're here to um, learn about lentivirus, so let's go uh, ahead with that. So Genecopia has three main areas in the lentiviral products and, and services. Um, the first is um, lentiviral clones and cloning vectors. These, again, are plasmid clones, like I talked about in the previous slide. But these are lentiviral backbones that can be um, used to um, insert various um, pieces of DNA of interest, like a, like a gene or an shRNA. And again, they're pre-made or custom clones carrying various genetic elements. Okay, they're available with multiple promoters, tags, and reporters. And we also have vectors for do-it-yourself cloning of sequences of interest. 
Secondly, we have a, a product line called Lent Effect Lentiviral Particles. This is a lentiviral particle production service where we will produce um, lentiviral particles that are ready to use, ready to go. And I'll talk more about that a little bit later in the webinar. But these can be either pre-made or custom packaged, again, ready to use lentiviral particles. And they're produced from either from Jane Copia's extensive genome-wide clone collections or from even customer submitted clones. And finally, and I'm going to talk about this as well, we have um, Lentipack, Lentiviral Packaging Reagents, which is a complete system of reagents for do-it-yourself lentiviral particle production. And uh, again, I'll talk more about that. So um, here are a number of um, highly important and advantageous features of Gene Copia's lentiviral products and services. Um, first of all, lentiviral um, products can be used to infect nearly all mammalian cell types. They can be used to deliver relatively large DNA sequences up to about 5 to 6 kb in length. And they can be used to generate stable cell lines or drive stable gene expression in organs and tissues in vivo due to integration of the transgene at random locations in the genome. Now, um, I just want to pause here and, and, and make a comment that um, even though lentivirus can be used in vivo, the scope of today's webinar is mainly about in vitro or cell line use. Um, but um, again, it is important to keep in mind that it can be used either in, in whole animals or cell lines. Okay, so here's an outline. Um, first, I'm going to go over lentivirus applications. And then um, I'm going to talk about, give a brief overview of the technology behind lentivirus. And then I'm going to go into more about the um, considerations for how to use lentivirus. Now, I must say, I will say that this, the intent of this webinar is not to provide detailed protocols, okay? Um, we do have detailed protocols, and I will provide links to those, but this is mainly about... Um, talking about strategies for using lentivirus and about considerations and things to watch out for. So yes, so I will talk about um, packaging lentivirus and then general considerations for transduction with lentivirus and finally things to look out for like a little bit of troubleshooting you know, for, for various issues. Okay, let's, let's talk about applications. So um, I always like to start this off with a question, why use virus for DNA delivery? Um, <clears throat> well, DNA, that's because um, most people, a lot of people who, have especially those who've never worked with um, viruses before, and this isn't, isn't just lentivirus, but there are other viruses that can be used for DNA delivery. Um, people always think first about using tra DNA transfection. Well, DNA transfection is great, obviously, and there are a number of advantages to using DNA transfection for DNA delivery, but it's not always possible or practical. Some cell lines are difficult or even impossible to transfect. Also, viral DNA delivery, at least in current technologies, is necessary, generally necessary for in vivo or therapeutic applications. And finally, um, another good, great reason for using viruses for DNA delivery is that most mammalian cells support infection by engineered lentivirus, and you'll see why in a minute. So um, one lentivirus application that's very important is to, um, <clears throat> is to use it for um, protein expression via open reading frame or ORF clones. <clears throat> so as I mentioned before, GeneCopia, um, we at GeneCopia provide genome-wide collections of human, mouse, and in some and in, and and also for some other organisms, um, ORF clones. And these are um, again they're available for most human and mouse genes, and we also have some rat and zebrafish genes available as well. In this case, only the ORF is inserted, so it contains no natural five prime or three prime UTRs. Those are taken place by um, the C uh, heterologous, strong constitutive heterologous promoters like CMV, and also the um, three prime UTRs covered by um, natural or artificial polyacites. We have 82 lentiviral vector types um, currently available, and we can also, and we do this many times, we make custom options. So if you want to say, if you want a different promoter, with a different selection marker, we can we can and we don't have it in in our normal repertoire. We can make that, um, and we have nearly um, 
whole genome collections available pre-made in three vector types. But the important thing, the, there are several important um, considerations uh, with the with lentiviral ORF applications. What can these be used for? Well, these are mainly used for like protein overexpression. Like if you want to produce a large amount of protein, or you can tag your protein with say GFP to track it in a cell line, or with FLAG for immunoprecipitation, things like that. So these these are um, very convenient vector systems for doing those kinds of protein overexpression applications. In addition to ORFs, we um, also have extended um, the genome um, analysis collection to uh, gene promoters. So again, we have, um, we have promoter collections um, available for most human and mouse genes, and these can be cloned into lentiviruses too. And what these are, these are actually um, promoter reporter systems. So um, Unlike the ORF clone, where we just clone the protein coding region, in the case of the promoter clone, we clone the region upstream of, of the gene. Usually it's about 1.5 kb upstream of the transcription start site to about 200 base pairs downstream. And these are predicted promoter sequences. And what we will do in these cases, we will um, join these promoter sequences to a reporter gene, such as Gosi luciferase, which is shown here, and when you, ins when you integrate these into the cell, introduce them into the cells, if the promoter is active, you will then get expression of the reporter. And in the case of luciferase, you can detect it with a luminometer. Or we also have um, fluorescent reporters like GFP. You can detect them by um, uh, uh, fluorescence microscopy. We have five lentiviral vector types available for promoters, and of course, custom options are always available. And I want to point out that exclusively from GeneCopia, we have a promoter reporter system of secreted Gosi luciferase, again shown here, along with secreted alkaline phosphatase. So unlike other luciferases, you don't have to lyse the cells in order to get luciferase activity. So you can analyze the same sample multiple times in like a time course assay, for example. Now, moving on, we also have a number of microRNA solutions um, that can be used with lentivirus um, for analyzing microRNA function. One of these is to um, is where we clone microRNA precursors, and we can clone any of the human and, and mouse um, myronome annotated microRNAs um, into these lentiviral clones, and they're usually expressed um, under the control of um, a Pol2 promoter like CMV. And uh, we also have microRNA inhibitors. If you want to do the opposite um, of expressing a precursor, you want to uh, inhibit the expression of a microRNA. We um, have these um, clones and lentiviral vectors where we clone these inhibitors, which are essentially um, oligonucleotide like sequences. And these are expressed from uh, RNA polymerase 3 promoters. And we have five lentiviral vector types. And as usual, custom options are available. We also have lentiviral um, solutions for um, using in RNAi, mainly for short hairpin or shRNA, and um, these are available available for most human, mouse, and rat genes. We express the shRNAs from either the U6 or the H1 promoter, both Pol3 promoters. We have 12 lentiviral vector types available, and of course, there are custom options and we guarantee the knockdown. And what we mean by guaranteed knockdown is these we provide sets of these, sets of four shRNAs cloning these lentiviral vectors, and we guarantee that if you don't get 70% knockdown at the transcriptional, at the RNA level, um, from one of the four, then we will provide a one-time free replacement of the set of four. And finally, um, everybody's heard about CRISPR, uh, of course. We have lentiviral solutions for CRISPR. Um, lentiviral vectors are widely used uh, uh, to express um, both the CRISPR-Cas9 nuclease or other um, CRISPR nucleases, as well as the single-guide RNA. Our um, lentiviral vector solutions are um, a two-plasmid solution where we have Cas9 on one plasmid and sgRNA on another plasmid. Um, we, 
Cas9 is expressed from a Pol2 promoter, but uh, sgRNAs are expressed from a, a, a U6 promoter because it's a short sequence, and that's needed. And it's uh, Pol3 promoter is needed to get proper folding of the RNA. And these can be used for gene knockout, knockdown, uh, also known as CRISPR inhibition, CRISPR activation, base editing, and more. And um, a great complement, uh, complementing product to go along with our CRISPR RNA lentivirus, um, CRISPR lentivirus solutions is our um, gene copia Cas9 stable cell lines. Now, um, the reason we have these is because as I mentioned, um, our lentiviral S SH, uh, excuse me, lentiviral CRISPR solutions are two component systems. Um, so this necessitates either co-transduction of Cas9 with a guide RNA plasmid, or um, since that's inefficient, we recommend people first establish a Cas9 expressing stable cell line. Well, for to provide for people's convenience, we have generated a large collection more than. 70 pre-made cell lines um, carrying the CRISPR-Cas9 nuclease. Some of these are integrated at the safe harbor sites in human or mouse, and some of these are integrated randomly by lentivirus. But these are great for, for doing um, lentiviral CRISPR applications because we take care of the first step of establishing the Cas9 stable cell line for you. And it's also great for doing um, CRISPR library screening if you're interested in that. Um, these are high quality. They're functionally validated for Cas9 activity. And again, they're ideal for lentiviral CRISPR applications. And um, this is how we validate the CRISPR um, Cas9 stable cell lines. We use an, an assay called the T7 nuclease assay. I'm not going to go into the details of the assay um, because it's beyond the scope of this webinar. But um, this, is, this shows a gel where... Um, PCR products generated from um, um, Cas9 stable cell lines that have been transfected or transduced with guide RNA expressing plasmids um, are treated with either without, as shown in this um, lane, or with T7 in a nucleus 1, which cuts heteroduplex DNA. And um, in every case, oh, excuse me, in every case we see um, that the presence of these additional bands indicates that um, the Cas9 is highly active in these cell lines. Okay, so now let's go into the technology overview of lentivirus. Um, lentivirus is, um, is actually a class of um, retroviruses that includes human, immuno, in, excuse me, human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV. Um, it also includes other... Um, other immunodeficiency viruses like FIV. But um, the reason HIV is important is because most of the lentiviral vectors in use today, and this includes gene copias, of course, are based on HIV. <clears throat> well, this is basically how an uh, overview of how HIV works. When the virus um, attaches to the cell, it gets um, incorporated inside the cell. And when this happens, the viral RNA is reverse transcribed into DNA, and then that DNA is integrated into the into the genome of the of the host. So the um, upon integration, the virus can lay dormant for a while, but then it can also become activated and express the viral genes. Um, and when it does, when it expresses these genes, it, inc it includes the viral packaging genes to make new virus which are packaged and assembled into new viral particles, which are then excluded from the cell. So HIV, natural wild type, most, most strains of HIV um, encode a single-stranded RNA genome of about 9.7 kb, although that does vary um, based on some of the isolates. Um, again, it integrates into gen genomic DNA, and most importantly, it infects both dividing and non-dividing cells. So this property of infecting non-dividing cells makes, makes HIV and its lentiviral derivatives very special because most viruses only defect vir uh, most, most of the useful viruses only infect um, dividing cells. Now, um, in order to use HIV as a gene delivery vehicle, it needed to be modified 
in order to make it both safe and effective. Now, HIV has gone through several generations in order to do just that, to make it more safe and effective. What I'm going to talk about now is the third generation lentivirus, which is um, the most widely used lentiviral generation today. Um, third generation lentivirus has undergone many modifications. Okay, the first is that um, the um, the all the viral um, protein coding genes have been removed from the vet, from the plasmid that you that's used to make the um, HIV genome. Okay. So this, this plasmid that's been stripped of all these protein coding genes is known as the vector transfer plasmid. So you can use this to insert a gene of interest. So it contains um, both the transgene of interest as well as the cis-acting viral packaging elements that are required for viral packaging. But again, no, no viral protein coding genes. Second, the um, viral accessory genes, um, NEF, VIF, VPU, and VPR have also been removed. Third, the viral, all the viral protein coding genes um, from GAG and Paul, and GAG encodes a number of different proteins such as matrix, capsid, and nucleocapsid. Paul um, encodes um, the protease and reverse transcriptase and integrase. All of these viral protein coding genes, GAG, Paul, and the envelope, have been and rev have been split onto three different plasmids, and the idea behind this is that um, when you when you co that the goal behind this is that when you co-express all of these, you don't want to make um, what's called replication competent lentivirus or RCL. Okay, so um, inside the cell, you just want to make a virus, but the virus you get, you don't want it to make more virus once it infects your target cell. So these three these these genes have been split among three plasmids. Okay, one plasmid contains GAG and Paul, and this is driven by a heterologous promoter. Another plasmid encodes the envelope. Okay, and the third is um, Rev. Um, next um, next um, modification in the third generation lentivirus technology is to change the envelope protein to um, encode for one that can infect different cell types. So HIV, naturally occurring HIV, infects mostly um, CD4 positive T cells and macrophages and a few other immune cells. But um, in order to, again, the goal here is to make this an effective tool. And so by replacing the normal envelope protein with um, protein from vesicular stomatitis virus G glycoprotein, this makes it makes the virus able to infect virtually any mammalian cell type to varying degrees. And this is a process known as pseudotyping. And you can actually um, place other um, envelope proteins from other viruses in here, but the most commonly used one is VSVG because, again, it has a very wide cell tropism. And finally, um, not, not finally, but the next modification I want to mention is um, the uh, 5 prime LTR has been truncated to remove the U3 region, and um, it's been replaced by a heterologous promoter. Now, this, this diagram shows the CMV promoter, but actually in, in Gene Copia's lentiviruses, um, it's the Rouse sarcoma virus promoter. And the whole point behind this modification is to remove TAT dependence. So TAT is an accessory gene of HIV, um, and the reason you wanted, you would want to do this is so that if you get infection with these viruses, um, if TAT were present, there's always the chance that um, if you had wild type HIV around, you could get um, generation of, you could get um, transactivation of generation of replication competent lentivirus. So by removing this U3 region, you make it TAT independent and you lose that helper function. And finally, um, the uh, U3 region of the 3' prime LTR has been removed. This is known as self-inactivation, and this was done to prevent um, integrating lentiviruses from activating downstream oncogenes. 
Okay, so again, this is a lot of modifications that have all been done to make HIV slash lentivirus a very safe and effective tool. So um, the idea, again, is that once you make a lentivirus from this system, it makes a virus that can infect a cell once and only once, and it can't make new virus. Okay, so one uh, consideration to keep in mind about lentivirus technology is the insert capacity. Uh, we do occasionally run into this. This is not a huge problem because, again, HIV um, slash lentivirus can accommodate inserts of about 4 to 6 KB pretty well. Um, but, and so, you know, that, and so you could have a pretty large gene in that case. But it's still limitations. The HIV genome is about 9.7 KB, and that includes both LTRs. Okay, uh, but the virus does have a physical limit. So once you start to get, once this um, length starts to get up around 9 KB, you start to um, lose the ability to effectively package lentivirus. Um, you don't lose it completely, but the viral efficiency or packaging efficiency goes down. So the titers, again, drop off when this distance starts to exceed 9 kb. But you can actually package it when it's up to about 15 kb. And then beyond that, you pretty much lose the ability. So if, you're, if you have a very large insert, um, a very large gene to package, it is something to keep in mind because you might have other things you want to put into the lentiviral vector, like a GFP, for example, or, or, some, or, or a, a heterologous promoter. Okay, so let's talk about um, packaging lentivirus. Okay, so let's say, you know, again, the, let's say you want you you you're curious. It's like, uh, you know, I th I think I want to get into this, but what do I need to do if I want to package my own lentivirus? Well, you need several components for packaging lentivirus. The first, and this is again an adaptation of the figure I showed before, um, you need several components. The first is a gag pol packaging plasmid, as shown here. The second is an envelope plasmid, and again, most commonly used envelope plasmid is VSVG containing plasmid. You need a third plasmid for REV, and then finally you need your transfer or vector plasmid, which is what contains your gene of interest. Okay, so it's a four plasmid system. And in addition to that, you need a packaging cell line. Most people use HEC293T cells, not, not regular HEC293, which is a human embryonic kidney cell line, but HEC293T. The reason for that is that these have been actually selected um, for, for being efficient at lentiviral packaging. And of course, you need a transfection reagent. Now, I wouldn't be telling you all this if we didn't have um, products for it, and we in fact do. Um, the first product I want to tell you about is the is Genecopia's Lentipack packaging reagents. Um, this is a system, a complete system for um, that's optimized for high titer lentiviral packaging. Um, it contains a packaging plasmid mix, so it's a mix of the packaging plasmid, the envelope plasmid, the VSV envelope plasmid, and the rev plasmid, the GFP control plasmid, or not not the GFP control plasmid, but a control plasmid that you can package. Um, also, a proprietary transfection reagent known as endofectin lenti, which is optimized for high titer lentiviral packaging, and titer boost, which is another proprietary reagent that increases viral titers five to ten fold. It's not essential for packaging, and so um, it's in some very unusual cases it might be toxic to cells. But if you can use it, it would be great because it really does enhance your packaging efficiency. Um, so in addition to the lentiviral packaging kit, um, we have um, Lentipack HEC293T packaging cells, as shown here, as well as endofectin lenti, transfection reagent. And um, further down the line in the packaging workflow, we have a titration kit, I'll talk about that, and a concentration solution. So we have um, a complete solution, we have complete solutions for every step in the lentiviral packaging workflow. Now, um, the next thing you might want to um, consider when once you've done your packaging, um, once you've done your lentiviral packaging in HEC293 T cells is purification. Now, purification um, 
is not required. The the um, the virus is extruded into the medium, as shown in in this diagram. Okay, once the once the um, packaging cells are transfected, they produce virus, which are, is then extruded into the cell medium. Now you can use just that medium to infect cells, but um, purification will actually do a number of things. It, first of all, it increase the titer. Okay, so it allows you to concentrate. It allows you to concentrate the virus, and this is important for some cells. It might be a little refractory to um, lentiviral infection, and it also gets rid of potentially unwanted cell debris and proteins from the medium. Now, purification is absolutely required, though, if you're doing in vivo or animal work um, used to avoid toxicity and immunological responses. But as I mentioned before, we're not talking about in vivo work today. We're talking about cell line work. So purification is not required, but it is helpful. And one method you can use for um, purification, a, a low level of a, a low level of purification is to use um, Gene Copia's Lentipack concentration solution. So it, this is a, there's a simple protocol for this. <clears throat> um, you just simply um, centrifuge or filter the particles through like a syringe filter to remove cell and debris, cells and debris. Mix with the concentration solution and incubate, and then centrifuge and resuspend in PBS or cell medium. And this can be used to concentrate the particles and increases the titer 10 to 100 fold. It also, again, helps in removing some cellular debris and proteins. Um, now, if, you, if you're curious, if you want to know more about that, we have a link to a detailed protocol, um, which is shown here, but I don't expect you to write this down and memorize it. Um, instead, I'm going to copy this link and paste it into the chat box. And I just pasted it into your into the chat box. If you're if you want to download this protocol, feel free to go ahead and and click on that link in the chat box in your in your control panel. Okay, so the next um, issue I want to talk about is titer. Okay. And by titer, I mean the concentration of particles in that are suspended in your in the medium. Okay, so this is this is a pretty important concept. So again, I pose a question here: Why should I determine the titer? Well, um, <clears throat> again, it's not absolutely required, but it is it is a really important thing to do, and it's necessary for two reasons. Mainly, to number one, to determine the success of the packaging reaction. And it's also needed to determine the correct volume of virus needed for infection, okay? Because some cells um, require more virus to infect and some cells less. And if you hit the cells with too much virus, I'm going to talk about this in a little bit, but if you if you hit the cells with too much virus, it might be toxic. So it's, it's really important to determine and know what the titer of your viral particles um, are. Now, there are a number of um, titration methods for uh, that can be used. Um, and first, I want to talk about the concepts of physical versus functional titer. Okay, so physical titer is expressed as the number of viral particles per mil. Okay, and these particles, it's physical because these particles can be either active or inactive. So um, as efficiently as the packaging reaction works, the cells can crank out into the medium inactive um, or non-functional particles. Okay, so you can express the physical titer as number of particles per mil or VP per mil, but titer is most often expressed in a, as a functional term, and that is as transduction units per mil or TU per mil. So you can determine the physical titer and extrapolate to a functional titer. Okay, you can also determine the functional titer directly by determining the, determining the actual number of infectious particles. And um, this is a lot more labor intensive than um, determining physical titer um, and requires a lot more time and patience and expertise. Uh, because functional titer determination works best if the lentivirus expresses a fluorescent reporter, although you can also use a colony forming assay following antibiotic selection. So in order to determine functional titer um, by the fluorescence method, you go through these basic steps. Okay, the first one is you 
um, you want to um, be able to infect a, a cell line that's amenable to lentiviral infection. We recommend using H1299 cells um, or HT1080 cells, but you can you can use other cells too as long as they're as long as they're amenable to infection. So on the first day you seed the cells, okay, in 24 well plates, and then the next day you can infect the cells with different volumes of virus. And then the third day you split the cells and transfer to six well plates, and then two days after that you very simply can either visualize the cells under a fluorescent microscope, or trypsinize the cells, count in a hemocytometer, and sort by fluorescence activated cell sorting or FACS. This is a very simple method to do and um, is very straightforward. However, it requires the presence of a fluorescent marker, which you're not always going to have. Okay, um, but if you do have it, this is essentially what you would do to determine the titer. The titer equals the fraction of positive cells um, times the um, total number of cells divided by the volume of particles that you use to infect in, in mil. So I, I give a, and I give a, a kind of a real world example here. If say 50% of, of 100,000 infected cells are fluorescent from one microliter of virus, then the titer equals 0.5 times 100,000 over 0 0.001. And that means that that equals five times 10 to the seventh transduction units per mil. Okay, and again, that's pretty straightforward, but it does take several days. Okay, um, and of course, with as with any good laboratory practice, um, we recommend doing triplicates so you get an accurate number. Now, again, you might not always have a um, a fluorescent marker on your lentiviral construct, in which case we recommend doing drug selection, and of course, that requires having a drug selectable marker like um, hygromycin selection or pyromycin selection. The procedure is somewhat similar, but it takes a lot longer because it's a colony forming assay. So again, on the first day you seed the cells, and again, we recommend H1299 cells. These are really good for determining functional titer. Um, the next day you infect the cells with different volumes of virus, and then on day three, split the cells and transfer to six well plates. Now at this point, you're going, instead of doing the fluorescence assay, which of course you're not gonna be able to do, on day five, you replace the medium with fresh medium containing antibiotic, like pyromycin, and then it can take up to another ten days, uh, eight to ten days or so, um, before you can actually see visible colonies on plates. And um, when you once you see those colonies, then you fix and stain these colonies with crystal violet, and then you count the colonies and estimate the fraction of positives based on the original number of cells plated. So again, similar to what I showed for the fluorescence assay, the titer is the fraction of positive cells times the total number of cells divided by the volume of particles. Um, so 50% of 100,000 cells are drug resistant from one microliter of virus. You get a similar result to what you got before, five times 10 to the seven TU per mil. Now, um, that's um, that's general overview of, of doing functional titer, but as you can see, um, doing a functional titer, while it is more accurate than determining physical titer, can take quite a long time and is very labor intensive. So instead, we actually recommend um, determining the physical titer, and this can very consistently be, be used to extrapolate to, to functional titer. Now, um, there are a number of, um, now what determine, again, physical titers determine the actual copies of virus, and they can be functional or non-functional, and, and use that to estimate the number of infectious viral particles. It's not as accurate, as I mentioned, as determining functional titer due to the detection of components that can be present in non-functional particles. However, it can be determined, it can be used to determine the titer for any lentiviral particle, whether it has a um, a fluorescent reporter on it or a drug selection marker or not, okay? And it's much more convenient, universal, and faster than determining functional titer. This is, this is something that can be done in a matter of hours instead of days or weeks. So there are a number of um, methods that have been used that are widely used for determining physical titer. 
Um, the two most widely used methods are the P24 method, which is an ELISA assay to determine the number of copies of P24 capsid protein in the sample. And also um, another widely used method is the qPCR method, which uses quantitative PCR to determine the number of viral number of copies of the viral genome. And this is actually faster and more convenient than the P24 ELISA method. Now, um, we actually, we have um, a solution for you to determine um, physical titer of lenti viral particles, and that is our lenti PAC HIV qPCR titration kit. So again, this is a qRT PCR based lentiviral titration to determine the copy numbers of HIV lentiviral particles. Um, it's simple, fast, and convenient. You can have the results in as little as two hours. And it contains all the reagents you need for RNA extraction, reverse transcription, and qPCR. And if you want to know more about this, um, there's a detailed protocol um, for doing this on our website at this link. And I will, as I did before, I will copy and paste this link into the chat box for you to download. And I just sent that link through the chat box. If you don't see it, you might need to scroll down a little bit, um, but it is there. Okay, so moving along, um, I just jumped ahead a little bit. So, um, so I just want to go over some important considerations, kind of like a things to watch out for in, in lentiviral packaging. Um, these, these are very important considerations to think about. Um, first of all is the generation, okay, the lentiviral generation. I mentioned before that um, the most widely used um, lentiviral generation right now is generation three, and um, the lenti pack, lentiviral packaging system is no exception. This is a generation three packaging system, so it requires four plasmids, including your transfer plasmid or vector plasmid, to get lentiviral particles. So this can be used for packaging gene copy lentiviral plasmids or any third generation plasmid but it cannot be used for generation for packaging older second generation plasmids because these older plasmids require TAT. And remember, I mentioned that the third generation system removes TAT. Um, another important consideration is that lentivirus must be handled in a, in a biosafety level two or BSL two facility. So you need to make sure your facility has this capability. Um, <clears throat> another thing is, Plasmid propagation, you should, um, we recommend transforming bacteria with your lentiviral plasmids, but when you do, you should use a stability strain of E. coli, like Gene Copia's GCI L3 um, competent cells or um, in vitro gene stable 3 cells. And the reason is that the um, lentiviral vectors have repeats in them, and um, E. coli doesn't like repeats. It tends to... <clears throat> undergo recombination and you can get deletions in your plasmid. But so you should use a stability strain. Um, also the plasmids should be endotoxin free. Endotoxin you may or may not know is a um, is a byproduct of bacterial metabolism and it um, it can make eukaryotic cells very sick or kill them and it's extremely hard to get rid of. So we recommend using a plasmid preparation protocol that removes ex endotoxin. Um, another consideration is that you should avoid freeze-thaw of lentiviral particles. Lentiviral particles, once they're produced, should be stored at minus 80. So um, we recommend that you make aliquots of your lentiviral particle preparation that are as small as possible, because every time you freeze-thaw a batch of lentiviral particles, the titer, you, you kill some of the particles, and so you reduce your titer. And then another consideration is how much to make, and this is a this is related to a concept of um, known as MOI or multiplicity of infection that I'm going to talk about very soon. Uh, another consideration is um, mycoplasma. So mycoplasma is a bacterium, a, a very simple bacterium that can be a real nuisance to um, cell culture. Okay, um, mycoplasma is a problem because when it in when it, it when it contaminates cell line cultures, it can slow down their metabolism or it can alter their DNA, and so it can actually um, make your cells sick or it can 
cause reproducibility problems with your experiments. Um, mycoplasma is a very common um, contamination problem. And so we recommend um, checking to make sure that your um, cell line cultures are mycoplasma free. So we recommend using um, Gene Copia's MycoGuard mycoplasma detection kit to test your cells for mycoplasma contamination. This is a very convenient PCR-based detection kit for that can detect multiple strains of mycoplasma. It's convenient. There's no need to pre-treat the um, cell culture medium, and it's fast. You get results in as little as two hours. And it's a it's a PCR-based assay, as shown here. Um, it's very sensitive. You can, um, <clears throat> um, as shown here, you can detect mycoplasma bands in both non-treated or boiled culture medium. This is how resistant um, mycoplasma can be to um, treatment, um, but it's a very sensitive and convenient assay kit. Now, um, I did just spend a significant amount of time telling you about um, considerations for packaging your own lentivirus, but if you um, don't want to do your own lentiviral packaging, well, we can do it for you. Um, we, um, so lenti so we, uh, I'm gonna, now I'm going to talk about, um, Gene Copia's custom lentiviral, um, particle production service. And these are the, some of the features that these particles are ready to use. And so we, you can just let Gene Copia do the packaging concentration and titration for you. Um, we usually get, generate high titers up to 10, one times 10 to the nine transduction units per mil. And it's available at two purity levels. One is um, standard purity for in vitro or cell culture use and ultra purified for animal models. Okay, so this is far more convenient, as you might expect, than packaging your own lentivirus. We just do all the hard work for you and send you the, send you the particles. Um, so let's talk about transduction with lentivirus. So once you've either produced your own lentiviral particles or received them from Gene Copia, well, what do you do? Um, well, it's actually very simple, but you do need to take in take several considerations in, the, in mind. Um, the first of these, again, is MOI. Um, we strongly recommend determining the optimal MOI of a cell line before use, or it may already be known, so you can look it up. Another significant consideration is the health of the cells. Um, the cells need to be pretty healthy. Um, we recommend low passage cells, and they definitely should be mycoplasma free. So be sure to um, screen them for mycoplasma contamination. Um, another consideration is selection or screening. How are you going to detect your infection, right? Um, next consideration is stable pool versus single clone. I'm gonna talk about that. Um, also, as I mentioned, um, these need to be produced in a biosafety level two facility, so you need to make sure that your institution is compliant. And finally, another consideration is adherent cells versus suspension cells. Do your cells grow stuck to a dish as a monolayer, or do they grow in suspension? Well, this is important to know because suspension cells are harder to infect than, inher than adherent cells. Okay, so let's talk about MOI, okay, or multiplicity of infection. I've mentioned this a couple of times, it's an important thing to keep in mind. So multiplicity of infection simply means the number of infectious particles per cell that you, that you treat the cells with. Um, there's usually an optimal number. If it's too low, you don't really get enough infection, um, which is not always a problem because if, you, if you're doing, say, if you're selecting for, um, say, hygromycin resistance, then you might be able to select for enough cells. But, it, but if you don't have a selection, um, then it can be an issue, okay? But if it's too high, if, if, if you, if you, you know, if you, if the amount of virus you treat a cells with is too high, it can be toxic. So it's good to find that balance, that, that optimal MOI. And this varies based on cell line. Now, I did mention earlier that, you know, um, Gene Copia lentivirus being VSVG pseudotyped infects most eukaryotic cells, but it does so to a varying degree. So um, that's where the MOI comes in because some cells are more amenable to transduction viral infection than others. Okay, so it does vary based on cell line and it's known for some cells, but others must be determined experimentally. 
Now, again, it is known for many cells, cell lines, and um, we at Gene Copia have already predetermined the, the optimal MOI for many cell lines as shown in this chart. So again, if 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 you don't know the MO, the optimal MOI of your cell line, we recommend trying to find out if it's if it's been determined before in many common cell lines. Um, of course, it has been like um, HeLa, HEC293, A549. Um, all you notice, you'll notice that um, these all, excuse me, these all have different optimal MOIs. Some are as low as um, one, like in MRC5 cells, but some are as high as 100. And what this means is that you need to treat um, um, QVEX cells with 100 times as much virus as you would with MRC5. Okay, so it's important to know this because this determines both how much virus you're making if you're packaging or how much virus you need to order from if, if you buy pre-made particles from Gene Copia. Now, uh, you can determine the MOI uh, yourself if you can't find it out. Um, there are a number of ways of doing this. So um, basically, it's it's pretty straightforward. You, you transduce the cells with varying dilutions of lentivirus. It can be any lentivirus, but it's important to have a good marker, and using a fluorescent marker um, is obviously ideal. It's just the much more the most convenient. Um, and we do have a protocol for transducing cells that can be used for um, MOI determination. It, this is the link shown here, and I'm going to copy and paste that into your chat box, like I did the other links. Okay, and I just sent you that link. So feel free to click on it and download the protocol. Okay, so um, now one great solution that we have at GeneCopia for helping you to, to determine MOI, I mentioned that um, having a fluorescent uh, reporter is a great way of doing it. Um, we at GeneCopia have pre-made control particles that express various um, fluorescent reporters like GFP. These are great. They're fantastic for predetermining um, the MOI of a cell line. And you can, you know, people have asked, can I use these even if I'm um, infecting my cells with a different virus? And the answer is yes. If you're, if you have a virus that has no fluorescent reporter, but it's expressing an ORF, you can still use these to, you can still use GeneCopia pre-made control particles to determine your MOI. So we have a number of different types. They, exp they express fluorescent reporters such as GFP, YFP, or M cherry. They're available with different selection markers such as pyromycin and neomycin. They're high titer, at, and they usually run about 10 to the eighth transduction units per mil. And best of all, they're pre-made and available for next day shipping. So you could have them tomorrow if you were, or, or Friday if you ordered them today. And this figure shows, um, uh, you know, what happens when you do serial dilutions of, of pre-made control particles and infect cells. So um, that was a brief overview of MOI, but um, if you want to know more about this and how important it is, um, there's a technical note um, available for download from our website shown here. This is the download link. And I will um, copy and paste that link into your chat box. And so you can click on that link anytime to download the PDF. OK. OK, so the next um, important thing to keep in mind about lentiviral transduction is the generation of stable cell lines, which is, the, which is usually the ultimate goal of infecting, um, stale, of infecting cells with lentivirus. So lentivirus, um, thanks to the presence of integrase in, in, in integration-competent lentivirus, stably integrates by default. This integration is somewhat random. It, it tends to integrate into protein coding genes, but sometimes into non-coding regions of the genome. <clears throat> um, and you can use antibiotic selection to either create a stable pool or to generate single clones. And this is an important choice to make is whether to create a stable pool or generate single clones. Um, alternatively to antibiotic selection, you can use fluorescent sorting like FACS. 
Um, and again, um, if you want to know more, if you want to know, um, have more detailed protocol, you can download our protocol for um, infecting cells, which I actually did um, put into the chat box earlier, but I will send it to you again um, if you feel the need or desire to get the protocol. Okay, so let's talk about the um, question of whether to generate stable pools or single clones. Okay, so a stable pool means that it's um, you infect cells with lentivirus, and then you select for drug-resistant cells, but without um, isolating single cells. This is usually sufficient for most experiments. Like if you simply want to see if the cells, um, if you just want to generate like um, high levels of protein, um, you might just need to generate a single, a stable pool. Okay. Um, but as I mentioned, lentivirus integration is random. So a stable pool will have, will be a mixed population mixed in the sense that each cell in the pool or each subpopulation of cells in the pool will have insertion of the lentivirus at different locations in the genome. Again, that's not always a problem but it can be, depending on what you want to do, okay? <clears throat> in addition to um, having insertions at different locations in the genome, it will also have different numbers of copies of insertions, okay? So if you're just doing a quick experiment where you just want to get C protein expression, stable pool is fine, but in some cases, like in genome editing applications, um, we recommend, we highly recommend um, isolating single clones. Now, um, and, the, and there are a number of good reasons for doing that. Um, first of all, you might want to have clones with different levels of expression. Like you might want a clone that expresses a, uh, your protein of interest at a low level and some that express at a high level. So you'd be able to do that by doing clonal isolation. Single clones also tend to be more stable over time. A lot of oftentimes with stable pools, people will see loss of like fluorescence expression, for example. Um, and again, that's because of the heterogeneous um, background. And also single clone isolation is good for cleaning up the genetic background. So to get rid of like unwanted mutations, for example. There are a number of ways of doing clonal isolation. A lot of it depends on your cell line or um, your experimental goals. Um, probably the most thorough way, one of the most thorough ways of doing it is to um, plate cells on, on, dishes, on dishes for single colonies and then pick them off of the dish with cloning cylinders. Um, another way, which is actually easier than picking single colonies and, and faster, is to do fluorescent sorting, but of course that requires the presence of a fluorescent reporter like GFP. Or you can do serial dilutions in multi-well plates. This is extremely labor intensive. Um, and it's usually used for suspension cells that don't have a fluorescent reporter. But this is really important because, again, it minimizes the potential effects of unwanted modifications resulting from random, random insertion, cell division, or off-targeting. Okay, so um, we're nearing the end of the talk. I just wanted to talk briefly about um, what, do you, what else you, you should do after infection. Um, that really highly depends on what you are expressing in the lentivirus, whether it's an ORF, a promoter, shRNA, CRISPR, etc. cetera. Um, this table um, shows um, things you can do, strategies you can do, depending on the type of insert you have in your lentivirus um, vector, um, as well as recommended gene copia products for it. For ORF expression, Expression, for example, you can do things like Western blot um, fluorescence, and that can be either um, looking at GFP expression under a fluorescent microscope or doing immunocytic chemistry. Um, you can do QRT-PCR to detect expression of your gene or maybe a luciferase assay. Well, GeneCopia has several products for that, such as labeled secondary antibodies. We have our all-in-one first strand cDNA synthesis kit for RNA extraction as well as our BlazeTech qPCR mix for qPCR. And we also have our Luke Pear Firefly and Renilla luciferase assay kits. If you're doing a promoter reporter assay, you can do either a dual luciferase assay 
or fluorescence. And for that, um, Gene Copia has our secrete pure gosial cyprase assay kits. Uh, you might be doing CRISPR, like a gene knockout, interference, or activation. And so for that, you can do either PCR-based mutation detection or qPCR. And um, for that, we have our Indel check insertion deletion detection system. Gene Copia also has the all-in-one, again, first strand cDNA synthesis kit, as well as our BlazeTac qPCR mix. Um, you might be doing shRNA for gene knockdown, in which case you might want to do a Western blot or qPCR. And again, we have labeled secondary antibodies or the first strand cDNA synthesis kit or qPCR mix. And finally, um, you might be doing microRNA analysis like from precursor inhibitor, and that is also a qPCR assay where you can use our all-in-one first strand cDNA synthesis kit or BlazeTac qPCR mix. All right, so finally, I just want to wrap up by um, a general section on things to watch out for or potential pitfalls. Um, one thing is um, expression. Um, sometimes stable cell lines lose gene expression over time, so you might want to consider single clone isolation and banking of multiple clones. Um, another thing to watch out for is your titer. Again, if your titer is low, um, it could be, there could be several reasons for that. One culprit is that the insert could be too big. Um, I know, again, with large genes like the Cas9 nuclease, for example, is notoriously large at 4.4 kb, and some other genes are even bigger than that. Um, if your insert is too big, it can cause your titers to be low, or your cells might be unhealthy. Okay, so make sure, again, that you use low passion cells. And again, it's important to watch out for safety. So make sure you're handling your lentivirus under BSL-2 conditions and cover up um, all exposed skin. So, And that's because these lentiviral particles can actually infect you. Um, so it's something to, something to keep in mind. Even though they can't make replication-competent virus, they can get into your, they can infect your skin cells. So it's just something to keep in mind. All right, so with that, I'm going to summarize. Um, I told you that um, lentiviral vectors are engineered vehicles that are highly efficient for DNA delivery to a wide variety of dividing and non-dividing cells. Packaging lentivirus is pretty straightforward, but it requires many components and experience to achieve good results. Um, infecting cells with lentivirus is simple, but requires much consideration of factors such as titer, multiplicity of infection, the health of the cells, and whether you need stable pools or single clones. And finally, GeneCopia provides solutions for virtually every phase of the workflow for using lentivirus to establish stable cell lines, from lentiviral plasmids, packaging reagents and accessories, lentiviral particle production, qPCR reagents, and more. All right, and um, before I take questions, I just want to tell you... Um, that we have a blog um, that you might be interested in. We just recently started, so please subscribe to our blog and stay up to date on the latest technologies behind GeneCopia's products. Um, and you can check out our first entry here, which is on using lentiviral vectors for screening cancer cells. This is the link to our blog post, but again, I will um, copy and paste the link into the chat box if you want to read more about this exciting technology. Okay, and um, so that's basically it. I'm going to stop and uh, take any questions you have. Okay, all right, so the first question is, um, can I use your packaging kit if I want to use a different pseudotype besides VSVG? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, we, we don't get that type of request very often. Most people, again, go with VSVG um, because of its wide cell tropism, but sometimes you might want to use a different, um, you might want to use a different pseudotype to restrict infection to a particular cell type. Um, unfortunately, you can't use the off-the-shelf version of our packaging kit for um, for pseudotyping with something other than VSVG, but we could we could come up, and that's because the plasmids are are mixed together, okay, and it includes the VSVG plasmid, the en envelope plasmid. So in that case, but we could we could generate a custom a custom um, packaging mix for you. 
Okay, um, next question, can I get the slides? Um, yes, you can get the slides. We will, um, we're going to make a recording of this webinar available as well as the slides available on our website um, sometime soon. So the answer is yes. Okay, um, any other questions? Okay, here's a question. Um, what is the price if you do the packaging? Well, that, 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 um, the price depends on several factors, um, mainly because based on the volume of particles that you need. Um, so there might be other considerations too, like the type of insert, but, um, you can, we, we can talk about it offline. Um, you can contact us and, and we can give you detailed pricing information. Okay. Next question. Do you have FIV? Um, yes, we actually do have some FIV solutions, feline immunodeficiency virus solutions. It's, um, it's usually part for custom orders, but we, we do have the capability of making those. Okay. Next question. Um, can I use this to inject mouse brain? Um, yeah, uh, unfortunately the answer, um, for this is, it depends. So again, what I was talking about today is mostly, about um, cell culture related lentivirus. The um, cell culture grade lentivirus cannot be used to infect, inject it, infect mouse brain, but you can, um, you can use lenti to infect mouse brain. You just need a um, higher level of purity, which we do provide. Um, so um, anyway, that's, that's it. So, uh, all right, any other questions? Okay, well, if there are no other questions, um, I just want to tell you um, at the once we um, go offline, you will be presented with a brief survey. Please do us um, a solid and, and uh, fill out the survey, and, and then we can get an idea uh, of our product, of how our products can better serve you. And uh, with that, I'm going to thank you all again. If you have any additional questions, um, go ahead and call me eight six six three six zero nine five three one extension two two seven or you can email me at edavis at genecopia.com or visit us on the web at www.genecopia.com. All right, with that, um, that's it. I want to again thank you and have a great day.